I work at the St. Charles Park District, which is located in the suburb of Chicago, Illinois. I work specifically at the Hickory Knowles Discovery Center. And today, we also have... Hi, I'm Lisa O'Brien. I'm the Nature Programs uh, Coordinator. I do a lot of the school programs. So uh, all the things you guys are learning in school, I've either taught or um, I've been working with schools through the Park District. So hopefully we can answer some of your questions today. Yeah. Well, and um, here at Hickory Knowles, uh, We've been a nature center now for, what, five years? Mm -hmm. Just about exactly five years. And um, over that time, we've seen thousands and thousands of uh, school kids coming here for field trips. Uh, we also visit schools, so this is a great opportunity to be able to interact with schools. Uh, I think we even have some visitors from Canada mm -hmm. uh, logging in today. Um, and what we want to talk to you about was something that, that we encounter frequently. Uh, working at a park district, we have... Um, um, of course, a lot of parks uh, throughout our town. Some are kind of your basic neighborhood playground parks, uh, you know, with uh, swings and slides, um, those kind of things. We've got a lot of athletic fields, but we also have several areas that we call natural areas. Um, they're prairies, they're wetlands, they're woodlands, and they uh, contain a lot of native plants and animals. Uh, we'll talk just a little bit about what that is in just a minute. Um, and we. One of our goals is to make sure that we keep what's supposed to be there uh, living and thriving. So the, the animals that would naturally live um, outside of Chicago, Illinois, as, as part of their environment, we want to make sure that they have everything they need to survive. But what we found um, over the years is that um, a lot of animals that we wouldn't expect to uh, see in our parks are showing up. Um, that's why we started a, a little program called Project Pet. Um, and really the goal of it is to try and protect wildlife from domestic animals. Um, that might sound a little bit unusual because a lot of times the message is the other way around. We try to protect our pets from wildlife. Uh, you know, you've probably heard about coyotes. Uh, sometimes they've been known to, to attack pets. Uh, raccoons can bite uh, your, your pet cat or your pet dog. Um, generally, you, know, you want to keep your distance from wildlife uh, because they are wild animals. Uh, but in, in so many people's minds, wouldn't you agree, Lisa, that mm -hmm. you know, people consider the wildlife to be dangerous um, and that the pets are, are all good? Well, but when you hear stories about coyotes and attacking dogs and people getting chased by red-winged blackbirds, you always have that fear that the wild is going to hurt you. And it could be true that um, wild, can, wild animals can hurt you, but it also can be that our pets are doing things to wild animals such as bringing disease and hurting them too, taking over their place. Yeah, where, where we first really started to notice this was a few years ago, and I, I don't want to get too bogged down in, in you know, bad things like when the American economy started to, to have trouble, but, but that's when we started noticing there were, part, uh, I'm guessing anyway, a lot of people that were not able to keep their pets anymore. And there's, there's sort of limited uh, places that you can take a pet that you can't keep anymore. One is, of course, an animal shelter. But back in 2008, 2009, most of the shelters were full. Um, to, uh, specifically, where, where I really started to, to get involved in this, um, uh, this project was uh, we were doing a summer camp at a forest preserve. Um, and there were lots of... Um, you know, wildlife around there were birds flying around, there were squirrels, there were chipmunks. Well, we saw a bunny one day, and the bunny did not look like our native cottontail rabbits. It was this beautiful, soft brown, and it almost uh, looked like a chocolate colored brown bunny that was clearly somebody's pet. And they had let it go uh, because they couldn't keep it anymore, we're guessing. Um, the the uh, forest preserve isn't really near a lot of houses uh, where this could have been a bunny that escaped. So we're, we're fairly certain that somebody let this bunny go on purpose because they couldn't keep it anymore. So we spent, we had summer camp there every day um, for several weeks on end, and we would see this bunny frequently, but we couldn't get close enough to catch it uh, until one day when we were able to catch it, and we saw it had gotten sick. Um, it had a lot of goopy stuff you know, around its eyes and its nose. Um, it just, it wasn't a healthy bunny anymore. Uh, we did contact a, a rabbit rescue group and they did agree to come out and um, collect it and they were going to take it to the vet and, and see if they could get it healthy again. Unfortunately, by the time we caught it, it was so sick that it, it actually died that night. So um, we started, uh, as, a, as a group, uh, staff here, we started thinking about, well, gee, what would have happened 
you know, clearly that, that animal was sick. What happened to any of the animals that it came into contact with? Um, maybe you guys, you know, maybe you've been in class and, and one of your, your uh, classmates has come to school with a runny nose and then maybe they've got a cold and then sometimes it's not too much longer and then the person they sit next to gets a cold and then the next person gets a cold and it, you know, the germs, they move all around. Um, the same thing can happen in the wild uh, with animals, the same way it does in schools, where um, an animal um, it can be uh, let go, and then um, it, a pet animal can then make wild animals sick. Um, and it, it was obvious with that bunny that he was not well. The drippy nose, the drippy eyes, he had very obvious signs of, of being sick. There are some animals, however, that look perfectly healthy. Um, and but can be harboring uh, germs inside of their bodies that can then make wild animals sick without the people who've let it go even knowing it. I'm, I'm going to introduce you to um, our first guest here. Um, Lisa's going to open up a pillowcase. And by the way, I don't know if any of you are, are considering going into a career where you work with reptiles and amphibians. It's called herpetology. but. Um, a great way, if you're ever going to be transporting a snake, is to use a pillowcase. Just make sure that mom or dad or grandma or grandpa, whoever the pillowcase belongs to, knows that that's what you're doing with it because they probably aren't going to want to sleep on it anymore after it's had a snake in it. Um, so anyway, this is Frankie. Um, Frankie is one of our education animals here at Hickory Knolls. Um, when would you say we got Frankie, Lisa? Was it? Right after we opened. Yeah. Five, six years. Long, long, several years ago, um, Frankie, uh, we got a call from a, a local nature center. Um, I don't know if you can see, that's one of Frank's uh, trademarks. He doesn't always get his tongue all the way back in his mouth. Um, but Frankie was um, dropped off at another nature center over uh, in Bartlett, Illinois, which isn't too far from here, us here in St. Charles. Um, and Frankie, now he's an example. He's, he's uh, a species called a fox snake. And fox snakes are actually wild snakes. You don't usually see them sold as pets, but um, they, they are quite attractive. You can see as markings. Um, and what we think happened was that somebody caught Frankie in the wild and tried to make him into a pet. Um, it didn't work. I don't know the exact circumstances because by the time we got the call from the people at the Bartlett Nature Center, Frankie was, they had found him inside a box on their front step. And the box was dirty and Frankie was dirty. And now his, his belly, which you can see, he's got a nice round belly now. He's, he's well fed these days. But back then, he was really skinny. Um, whoever had tried to keep him as a pet either wasn't feeding him at all or they weren't feeding him the right things. Um, the Bartlett Nature Center has a lot of fox snakes that live in the wild, in the grounds around their building. And so, again, we're only guessing, but we think what happened was somebody tried to make him into a pet. It didn't work, so they brought him back in the hopes that maybe he could get put back. But that whole thing we were just talking about with animals carrying germs that can make other animals sick, because Frankie lived in captivity uh, especially because he lived in an area he was like I said, he was really dirty. There's a really good chance that even though he's healthy, um, he could be carrying germs that would make the wild fox snakes sick. So Frankie came to live with us. Uh, he's doing great. We actually use him um, for programs um, like this. He goes to a lot of schools. He's a great ambassador because he's he has gotten used to being around people. He wasn't so easy to handle at first, but. Um, we help remind people that there's uh, a lot of uh, native snakes in our area that have important jobs to do. Frankie's job is to collect rodents, uh, catch rodents, eat rodents, um, and help keep populations of, of mice and, and voles and things like that down. So um, he does, we, we feed him uh, frozen mice here, so he's, he's continuing to have his, his wild diet. He's just not able to do his job in the wild the way he really you know, should be doing. So that's um, one thing we'd like to, to remind you of is if you if you want a snake as a pet, please work with a, a breeder or uh, someone who's going to give you a snake that was bred in captivity because taking one from the wild isn't isn't such a good idea because you can't really just release them when you're done. There's a very good chance that you'll be releasing not just the snake, 
but a lot of uh, bacteria and germs and things like that that could make wild snakes sick. The other thing you need to remember too is that if you're taking something like a pet like the bunny Pam talked about, people think because they're animals they know how to live outside and a lot of times they don't. You put them out in a forest preserve or you put them out somewhere you think they're supposed to live and there's already animals living in that habitat so they have to kind of find their way. They're used to having pellets or whatever you've given them to eat and now they have to find a whole new diet so that affects them as well. So you can't just assume that they know how to survive in the wild. That's true. You know, I, I and it's, it's funny because you know, sometimes you think, well, maybe the person was, was young, they didn't really know. But I, I talk to a lot of adults, too, who don't realize that a pet bunny is very different from a wild bunny. A cottontail rabbit is a, is a species that's native to North America. Um, the, the bunnies that are sold as pets, they're actually a European uh, species. They're not um, uh, really very closely related at all to the wild rabbits that we have here. Uh, in North America. And they may not also even have instincts to be able to evade predators because they're used to being cared for or in cages. So they might have not any idea how to get away from a hawk or get away from a coyote or something like that. Mm -hmm. So you're really not doing them a service by putting a pet out in the wild thinking they're just going to be able to adapt to whatever they're given. That's, that's a great point, Lisa. Um, I hear a lot of times, I think we all hear it here uh, at the Nature Center, that someone, uh, if they're thinking about letting an animal go, they're using the term we want to give it its freedom. And that sounds, I mean, who doesn't want their freedom? It's a, it's a great term. And yes, we all want to live free. But some animals, um, you know, they're most at ease when they are living in a captive environment. Um, of course, that, that area, whether it's a cage or an aquarium or whatever, it, it does need, you know, they need to have food, they need to have water. Um, it needs to be large enough for them to move around, but they are actually safer there than they would be out in the wild. What do you? What do y'all see have with it? Well, we have another snake. We want to share his story. Um, this was a snake that was somebody's pet. We knew it was some. Well, we can deduce it was somebody's pet. Nobody came to us with this snake. Um, he has an interesting name. His name is Oscar. Uh, any of you who might be young enough to have watched Sesame Street, you might know. Of an Oscar a there. certain Oscar. Oh, here he comes. Excellent. This you want to tell Oscar. this story? Um, I will. You can help me tell the story. Uh, Oscar. <laughs> Lisa uh, loves snakes. <laughs> yes, I've actually learned to appreciate snakes. Uh, I not really care for snakes, um, but having worked in a nature center, you have to, especially when we have one that has lots of snakes, you have to learn to respect <laughs> them, and I do respect them. Uh, because they do have a vital role in the ecosystem. Um, Oscar is a Puebloan milk snake. Hold him. How about you hold him? There we go. Um, so he's not from Illinois. He actually is from Mexico. You can tell his beautiful color pattern there. Uh, Oscar got his name because he was found in a garbage can. And he was found in his container in a garbage can uh, by one of our parks personnel. And that's how he got his name. So obviously, Oscar was somebody's pet. They decided they were moving, didn't want him. Um, the thing you need to remember, as Pam was saying, if you're going to have an animal as a pet, you need to kind of be in for the long term. Um, however long that pet's going to be alive, and snakes can live quite a long time. If you move, you, um, you go to college, you don't want to have your pet anymore, you better find someone who can take care of them rather than just putting in the garbage or putting them out in the wild, um, because they can't survive like that. And it just so happens that somebody found Oscar so that we could take him in and actually give him what he needed. And he, again, is an awesome snake to show people you know, what reptiles are and how they work and how they, how they um, eat when we feed them the snakes and uh, mice, I'm sorry. So uh, he's a great one. Again, he is not from here, so now if someone had turned him loose or he'd gotten out of that garbage can, we would have a non-native snake living in our habitat or trying to live in our habitat with other things, he had no idea you know, where to catch food, how to catch food, uh, what the other snake species are. So he could be bringing even something different into that environment because he is from another area besides being a pet. Well, and I, you know, as we're talking, Lisa, it's it's kind of my um, we're using these terms of native, non-native, wildlife, pet, and maybe we need to clarify a couple of things. Um, one of um, I'm just gonna I'm gonna hold up a book here. Um, a great way to, to become acquainted with, with what is uh, native or, or you know, belongs in your area is to become familiar with uh, books called field guides. Um, I'm holding up here a bird field guide, um, and it's a Peterson Guide to Eastern Birds. So it's, it's basically a, a, a book to help identify all the birds that live in the eastern United States. 
But what I wanted to show you guys is the back of the book. Um, different field guides have different arrangements here. Uh, the Sibley field guide um, does the same kind of thing. Um, they list, uh, you know, they, they describe the species, but then they have a map. These maps are really important to figuring out if something is native or not. A range map will tell you if an animal belongs in a certain region or not. Now, um, with wild, especially now with the way our, our climate seems to be changing, some of these maps aren't quite as accurate as they, they once were, but they do give you a sense of, oh yes, this animal belongs here, or no, this animal actually is from uh, another continent even. Um, so that's, uh, we use these a lot if we um, do see something that we've never seen before. Uh, it, it's a great way, uh, whether it's a bird field guide, a mammal field guide, a reptile field guide, um, they will have some sort of range map in there. We do have a question here. Um, Elgin High School wants to know, uh, the strangest animal we've ever stumbled on. Um, I'd say for me personally, it was a ferret. Um, and not just one. I did two separate occasions I found mm -hmm. ferrets. One, uh, the ferret was let go um, in uh, one of our parks. Uh, the animal actually came up to me. And it's really surprising. though. You, you think you go out for a walk in nature and all of a sudden this animal is pulling on your pant leg. This, this poor thing was clearly someone's pet. Um, I, when, I, when I picked it up, it, it, was, it was just so thankful to have a human, even though I wasn't its human. It was, it was glad. I think it had it spent the night out there and was probably quite scared. Um, so I, I carried it back uh, to my car, and along the way I found a box that had a little dish of food and a little dish of water. And um, you know, the person who left it there, I guess, thought that that would be sufficient for its survival. Um, I ended up taking it um, at that time. That was probably 15 years ago. Um, I took it to a local animal shelter. They contacted the ferret rescue people, and the ferret was able then to find a home. I found another ferret, or actually another ferret found me. <laughs> probably five years after that, I was working at a different nature center, and uh, it was a very cold day. I'd been out for a walk. I was going into the building. I opened the door, and something ran in in front of me, and it was a ferret. Again, somebody had let it go. It was cold. Um, it just wanted to be back in familiar surroundings, which for a pet like that would be inside of a building. How about you, Lisa? Have you seen anything weird? I haven't seen anything weird in the sense of pets turning loose. I end up stumbling upon native stuff. Um, one of the things was uh, Blanding's turtles. You guys might know that Blanding's turtles are endangered species uh, in this area. That's right. And I, it was funny, the other day I was going through some pictures um, of animals that had visited my yard, and I come across one uh, that was a mink and then a Blanding's turtle, which at the time I didn't know was a Blanding's turtle. And then I've come across them again when I was out on the bike path. So, you know, just keeping your eyes open, you can see a lot of these interesting species that actually uh, also ran across a, I didn't run over, but ran across a fox snake out in the bike trail too. So, you know, just being out and about, you can see lots of different and interesting types of um, wildlife. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's helpful. If you can spend a lot of time outside, you, you do kind of develop a sense of what's usual. And that can then help you determine something that's unusual. Now, we're going to put uh, Oscar back in his pillowcase, but he saw he had bold red and white and black stripe around his body. And um, that's definitely an eye catcher. Now, we, we do have a native milk snake in our region. Um, they're actually the same species. They're just different subspecies, uh, the eastern milk snake and the Puebla milk snake. Um, but it, the, the, the way this color is distributed is quite different. And um, to come across a, a boldly patterned snake like Oscar is, that would definitely be something very unusual. Yeah. Um, we've So far, we've talked about uh, things that um, are, um, they all have backbones. I think, Lisa, maybe we could share um, <laughs> another story. Um, an animal that's not native or doesn't belong doesn't always have to be a, a pet. Um, I'm going to hold this up. I don't know if any of you have seen anything like this. You can see it was growing like the, the plant was growing like this, and then this blob was deposited on it. We're going to guess last fall because that's usually when this happens. Lisa, what is this? That is a praying mantis egg case, and we've actually discovered there's a couple different types of praying mantises. This actually is a Chinese one. Uh, we are guessing uh, that the native, we do have native praying mantises uh, in Illinois, probably not this far north, uh, but we do have them. But this one we see a lot in our um, fields and our, at forest edges. Uh, Pam and I went out 
looking for these eight cases, thinking we wouldn't find very many. And within what, 20 minutes, we each found about 10. Oh my God, it turned into a little sort of, uh, would we say hyper competitive. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we 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 really we just wanted a few. Uh, we had some local school teachers that thought it might be neat to hatch an egg case out and then raise a, a praying mantis. Uh, as Lisa mentioned, these are uh, Chinese mantids, so they are not native, uh, not just to this area, but they are not native to the United States. However, we are seeing more and more of these because these are often sold um, through garden shops and garden websites. Um, because as you, you might know, a, a praying mantis is a great catcher of insects. Um, they were sold as what's called a biological insect controller. So gardeners, they thought, well, I'm going to buy this egg case, and these praying mantises are going to hatch out, and then they will um, catch the bugs that are eating my plants, and then um, I won't have to use uh, insecticide. I won't have to spray poison around. So in theory, that sounds like a good idea. But what's the problem? They are out competing our native uh, praying mantis and other bugs. And people are misinformed because they think that these praying mantis are, because we see a lot of them, that these are native ones. And so we're buying more and more. And they're outside in the native popul in the natural population. So people are actually thinking that they're the great thing when. Uh, they are really cool. I mean, they look like aliens. And they're out competing some of the other creatures that are there, like the spiders, right? We can right, yeah. Spiders. A lot of native spiders are having a hard time because a. a Female Chinese praying mantis. Uh, it's going to be hard to tell size-wise, but eight inches long. Um, guys, Google this later if you want. Um, the uh, there, there's records of female Chinese mantids uh, eating hummingbirds, eating snakes, eating mice. I mean, these things are huge, and that's probably one of the the biggest issues with them is that they, I guess you know would be one thing if they would uh, prey only on uh, you know, insects that are doing harm in the garden, but they really don't. They eat a lot of good things themselves. They, they eat uh, ladybugs, they'll mm -hmm. eat uh, dragonflies. They really will eat whatever flies close enough for them to grab. They've got these two um, spines on their uh, forelimbs, and they use that to grab insects and just literally rip them to shreds. So they're, they're, not, a, they're not specific to certain insects or, or you know, a certain kind of prey. Uh, they, they eat um, all different kinds of animals. And yeah, they are starting, we're wondering anyway, if they are starting to displace some of our native natural uh, insect predators like spiders. We have um, in this area here, um, we have a beautiful uh, black and yellow spider. Some people call them banana spiders. Some people call them garden spiders. Um, they're uh, also called our jayapi spiders, um, but they, they spin this beautiful orb, round web, and um, it seems as though they're getting harder to find. And it, in, in the areas where it's hard to find them, it's easy to find Chinese mantids. So we don't know yet, you know, no formal studies have been done, at least not that we know right. of. But, Just uh, uh, casual observers who are looking for spiders haven't been able to find them and have been reporting them. Yeah, and, and you know, Lisa and I, our, our little experiment, a couple I guess it was last winter yeah. when we went out, and yeah, we were hoping we would find One a two. few, yeah, and we filled our pockets. Um, that actually uh, brings up another topic. It's not always um, allowed, you know, collecting is not always allowed in, in natural areas. Um, we do have permits to do that, but where exceptions are usually made is if you're collecting something that doesn't belong there anyway. Um, if, uh, there's a class out there who's maybe thinking of, of doing a Chinese mantid project. Um, I would suggest you get permission from whatever agency owns the land first, just to make sure they're okay with it. But everybody we've ever talked to or worked with has been glad to get rid of these because, like I said, they, they do, um, the uh, adult insects do cause, uh, can really cause a big problem. The thing with some of these things like the these mantids is like they may not have been brought here because someone wanted to have Chinese mantids, but they might have come in potting soil or some other means where we didn't even know that these invaders were coming until they were here and they were a problem. And Pam has found some other animals out there like the hammerhead worm oh, um, yeah. that's come from Asia. So there's some things that are not pets and they're not being purposely brought here for a reason. They just kind of end up here because of the world trade that we have and things are just coming and going. And so we're seeing a lot of impact by just this whole sense of that we're more of a global community than we were before. Yeah, um, 
I do have some pictures of a hammerhead worm. I don't know if it would be possible to, to show them during this webinar, but certainly Google hammerhead worm. That's a great example too, Lisa, of a, a non-native animal that's actually preying on yet another non-native animal. Um, uh, if you look up hammerhead worms, they don't look like the average worm that you would think of if you're thinking about either composting worms or uh, fishing bait worms, but they're they're kind of yellowish. Um, they're maybe, you know, what would you say that is, three, four inches? Yeah. With a flat body. In a, uh, they almost look like a flatworm because they have a kind of planaria head on them. And we got a question here about if they jump. I don't believe the ones we saw jumped. No, I know what you're talking about there, Elgin High. Um, these guys, uh, they are, um, I believe they're Asian, um, but they're, those guys um, that you're talking about, they're, they're very active, they're very squiggly. These guys, um, what they do is they feed on um, uh, earthworms, which in our area also are not native. And what they do is they, they kind of slither up next to them and they, they lay alongside, a hammerhead worm will come upside uh, alongside a, a native or a, a non-native earthworm. And they have um, an external digestive process. So they, as they're sitting there, they're releasing these digestive enzymes and they kind of liquefy the earthworm that's on the sidewalk. And um, then the hammerhead worm slurps up the earthworm. Um, that would probably rank up there with one of the, the more unusual things we found out in the parks. Um, you know, it's um, a message that we're, we're trying to, to also get out is that there are alternatives if, if a message that we're, we're trying to, to also get out is that there are alternatives if, if because let's be honest, not everybody can keep a pet for its entire life. It would be good if everybody could. And that's where a lot of research would, would be handy if you are thinking about something. You know, like, um, let's get uh, Daisy up here. Yeah. Um, Daisy's a box turtle um, that was uh, found uh, in our area. In suburban Chicago, where we live and work, um, box turtles are no longer uh, part of the ecology here. They, um, they do live in Illinois. They just don't live around here. So this would be an example of a, a native to Illinois animal. But uh, again, seeing one in our area would be very, uh, there aren't any that live in the wild anymore. So, so finding her was very unusual. Um, box turtles, even though they're commonly kept as pets, they live 50, 60, 75, even more. There's, there's records. I don't know if, if they're you know, valid records, but I, I've heard stories about box turtles living 100 years. That's a really long time to commit to owning a pet. So you know, sooner or later, a pet like this may have to be rehomed. Um, there are, thankfully, uh, in the last, I would say, 15 to 20 years, a lot of rescue groups have come into play that, that focus on pets that aren't the traditional cats or dogs. Um, there's what the uh, Chicago Herp Society, uh, you know, a lot of um, clubs that people belong to for specific types of animals will also help do rescue work. Um, this, we were, were you know, fortunate that we could use uh, Daisy in our programming, and so we were, you know, we brought her in, and um, she just lives with us now. But there, there is that that misconception of, well, if I, if I get a turtle as a pet and I can't keep it anymore, turtles live around here. I'll just let it go without regard to, you know, what the habitat requirements are for a box turtle. Now, um, Daisy, um, we're guessing she's in her 30s. That is just a guess. You can see her shell has a considerable amount of, of uh, use or abuse. Yeah. <laughs> Parts are missing. Uh, but she herself is, is strong and healthy. Um, the, uh, she lives with, with another box turtle uh, who didn't join the webinar today. But the reason we have that box turtle is the owner called and said, the question was, well, do turtles live in the Fox River? That's the river that runs through our town. The answer is yes. We've got several different species of turtles that live in the river. However, none of those species are box turtles. Um, yet this person felt, well, it's a turtle. It should be able to live in the river. Thankfully, they called us first and we said, you know what, just bring her here. So we did, at that time, have need for another box turtle to use for, for programs like this. 
um, we don't, though, have room for any more. Um, and that's something, too. Sometimes people think, well, I can just give it to a zoo. I can give it to a nature center. No, I can't keep it. Is that a good idea? No, it's not, because sometimes the people in those areas either can't take the animals because they don't have space, they don't have training, or um, because they just legally can't have some of the things that you might have to do legally. So you can't just assume someone else is going to take on your pet. You really need to have your pet as your pet. And then if you can't have it, you know, do the best you can. But last resort, actually not even a resort, is to turn it out in the wild. Um, try and go to some of those societies that can help play some of these animals versus just assuming someone's going to be able to take it like a nature center. Yeah, and just to touch back to what we started with, um, an animal that's lived as a pet is going to have different uh, bacteria and, and germs and other things living inside of it that could very well make other uh, wild animals sick. And it could be that if you have this animal, and you know, sometimes people like to turn their cats or dogs out, their pet cats or dogs, just to have fun playing in the yard, and they have a parasite or something, they can pass it on to things outside too. So you really need to be careful about what you're doing as far as leaving, putting animals inside and outside because they could be carrying something in, and you not putting them out, you're not releasing them in the wild, but they're also still transmitting things. Like that. Mm -hmm. like, our turtles at one point had a fungus on them, and we've treated it, and she's fine. But had you had this as a pet, and then you turned it out because oh, it's sick, uh, then you know who knows what you might have been transmitting to other animals. Well, and uh, that brings up another good point, Lisa, of of pet animals like cats and dogs. Um, I know in our area, and it seems to be a, a national and and even international issue, is um, the concept of uh, feral or wild cats, but not a true uh, native wild cat, like a bobcat or a cougar, but a feral cat, which would be a domestic breed of cat that now lives uh, outside. Um, there's a tremendous uh, amount of data that's being gathered on the impact of feral cats in the wild, and it's, it's a really hard message to get out there because, I don't know how many of you have pet cats, but cats are, um, you know, one of the most popular pets in the world. A lot of people identify with a kitty. You know, I have a cat. My cat's name is Jimmy. He's awesome. You used to have cats. I used to have cats. And they're 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 really cute. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> However, there's a, a seemingly a growing number of feral cats of pet uh, cats that are now living in the wild, and um, there's a lot of controversy about what to do about them because people do look at them as pets, even though they're not tame enough to really live in a house anymore. And um, there's, a, there's a big problem with feral cats eating native birds. Um, it happens around uh, here where we live in the Chicago area. It happens throughout Illinois, I would say. Would you say it's safe to say it happens? No, it's probably everywhere. Throughout the United States, around the world even, um, the impact of feral cats on uh, wild bird populations. So um, there's a lot of tough questions being answered now. There are some groups that have... Um, started capturing those feral cats and spaying or neutering them so that they can't have babies in the wild, thinking that'll help control the population. And that does, that, that can help keep some numbers down, but two things. One, people are continuing to let their cats go when they can't keep them anymore. And then two, even if an animal can't have babies, it can still eat wild birds. So you know, there's a lot of tough conversations that need to be had, a lot of decisions that need to be made about what to do with feral cats because um, they are, I was at a state park recently near us, it's called Star Rock, it's pretty famous, very uh, wonderful wild areas with lots of neat native wildlife, and I saw cats just about every trail I hiked on. So, oh, I've never seen cats. Yeah, yeah well, not deer. that's because you like cats. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, they, they are showing up in a lot of different areas, and, and it is um, you know, something that's going to have to have some some discussions about what, what can be done. Want to take a look at this bucket? Yeah. Um, another little story. Uh, here at Hickory Knolls, and I don't know if any of you were uh, participants in our webinar last year on Blanding's turtles. Lisa mentioned Blanding's turtles earlier. The Blanding's turtle is a species that's been declared uh, uh, is endangered here in Illinois. It's endangered in a few other states too. It's it's not quite considered federally endangered yet, but uh, I know it's a candidate to be listed uh, because its numbers are going down. Um, Blanding's turtles are, um, they have to be quite old before they can lay eggs, and um, they also 
are mobile. They like to walk around a lot. And um, turtles in suburban environments like where we live and work, mm -hmm. yeah. they can't walk very far with having to cross a road, without having to cross a road. And when they cross a road, a lot of times they don't make it to the other side because turtles are, even a turtle moving quickly is still kind of slow. Mm -hmm. They get hit by cars. So um, a few years ago, we got involved in what's called the, the Blandings Recovery Project. And in our uh, lobby of our building, I wish we could walk out there, but we're right over there. We have a, a pond with uh, seven captive bred Blandings turtles that are part of a breeding project. The goal is to have them reproduce in captivity and then have their babies released into the wild once they're, they're big enough that they can survive on their own <clears throat> without getting eaten. Um, well, our Blandings Turtle Pond is kind of a special place. It's um, because that whole thing we've been talking about, about um, trying to, to keep uh, wild animals free of uh, germs that are found in captive animals. We've been really careful about how we take care of those Blandings Turtles. Um, one of the uh, requirements of that pond was that no other turtle species be allowed to live in there. And that was fine for what? Four years? Four years. Four years. Uh, we had a Blandings Turtle Pond with just Blandings Turtles in it. And then one day last summer, um, I was talking to a visitor. Uh, a man and his son came, and they uh, were so excited because they had been out on a walk, and they'd seen a turtle in the road, and they rescued it. So they said they, they moved it from uh, out of the middle of the road off to the side of the road so that it would be out of danger. Um, I said, well, you know, do you know what kind it was? And the man said, yeah, it's like the ones you have in your pond. And I got all excited. I'm like, oh, my goodness, you found a Blandings turtle. Where were you? He said, well, I don't know if it's a Blandings turtle or not. It's, it's like that turtle you have with the stripes on its head. Here is not a Blandings turtle. This is a painted turtle. It's a Midland painted turtle. So it is a species that's native here um, in the Chicago area. Um, and somebody, we assume we got, we got turtle dumped. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you, you hear people dumping kittens and puppies. Well, we had a turtle dumped in our turtle pond. And again, somebody probably saw, oh, this turtle lives near water. Here's a turtle pond. You know, we want to help it. So we'll put it in here. It didn't tell anybody. And so, you know, we were concerned because now we have this endangered turtle species that we're trying to be part of this program with. And we had no idea where this turtle came from. So we didn't know what kind of disease it had. Was it wild? Was it somebody's pet? And even in the wild, these turtles can carry diseases. So here we have these threatened turtles, and then we thought we might lose them because the, we didn't know what this turtle was bringing with it. If the, the ecologist we work with, he was he was not real thrilled when he found out what had happened in our pond, um, but he also did mention he, he was kind of surprised it hadn't happened sooner than it did. Um, because there, there is um, people who maybe they've tried to do the right thing. Maybe they've made those calls. Maybe they've talked to rescue groups. Maybe they've been turned down. Um, painted turtles are one of uh, two or three species that are just so very common um, that they don't, um, there's not really a market or a need for them. People don't really want to keep them as pets because they're so common. So that's, that's another problem. What do you do with it? Um, there was actually talk of, of euthanizing this turtle because there's no good place for it. We don't have room for it. Nobody else has room for it. Um, you'll notice, um, and this is again, it's, it's kind of a guess, but can you see that big dent there in her shell? We're thinking that whoever put this turtle in our pond had maybe found her injured and nursed her back to health and then didn't want anything further bad to happen to her. So she thought, they thought, well, you know, what's safer than an indoor pond? Um, so, she, um, boy, she is getting really squirmy. Um, <laughs> she uh, thinks she's squirmy. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, Mr. Thompson, our, our, the ecologist we work with, he um, you know, is really wondering you know, how compromised our Blandings turtles are. Um, were they exposed to um, dangerous pathogens, germs, things like that? Um, what's going to happen now is if those turtles do go anywhere, they're going to have to be tested pretty thoroughly to make sure they're not going to make any other Blandings population sick. Uh, question, how many turtles do we have? Um, we have seven turtles in the Blandings Turtle Recovery Program that are staying with us right now. But those turtles, um, those of you who are watching in the Chicago area, you may see um, news about the Blandings Project because they, those 
turtles do move around quite a bit. Um, up in Lake County in Illinois, uh, there's a group of uh, landing turtles that are part of that project. Uh, Brookfield, Brookfield Zoo. Zoo. Yeah, yes. even Cosley Zoo. Cosley Zoo, if you go there, or if you went there when you were small, that's in Wheaton, Illinois, um, you actually see the little baby landing turtles that are about this big uh, in black tubs that they have raised. Um, they hatch out the eggs and they raise them there to a certain um, age and then they go to some another facility. And I think uh, Brookfield's got them roaming around outside of testing that, being mm -hmm. in outside pens. So uh, Peggy Notabart Museum in, in uh, Chicago is a partner in the program. I think Lincoln Park Zoo probably has some too. Um, but a lot of, a lot of, um, Institutions throughout the Chicago area are involved in that landings project. So this this um, one turtle showing up could potentially have a, a huge negative effect on that program. Um, but besides the landings, we have those seven landings. Um, we have our one painted now. We have three box turtles and one soft shell. Soft yeah. Shell. So we've got a, a number of different turtles. Uh, we were doing really well at keeping all the different types separate until until this one showed up. And some of you might ask, well, don't these live with the blandings? And yeah, if in the wild, there probably are blandings turtles that are living with painted turtles and red-eared sliders and different types of animals. Um, but, you know, they were hatched and born and live in that area, so they kind of get an immunity to the area, whatever might be in that specific spot as far as disease or not. And they're acclimated to the conditions of the water and the area that's there. Um, so with our turtles kind of being raised, I won't say in a sterile environment, but a very controlled mm -hmm. environment. We look at the pH and we monitor the water and everything that they eat. Um, it's a little bit different having this outside turtle in there versus All of a sudden uh, show up. You know, a normal habitat where they would have been born into a, a diverse habitat of animals. Native, yeah. Well, and you know, I'm, I'm reminded of a story. It, it kind of reaches beyond uh, science class and into history, but uh, some of you may have heard about uh, the the Native Americans uh, that were present on this continent when the Europeans uh, started uh, coming this way back in the 16 and 1700s. Um, well, in Europe, there was a disease called smallpox. And uh, it was typically a fatal disease. And if you did survive it, it was a very painful thing. You know, you'd get all these blisters, horrid blisters all over your body. Um, well, <clears throat> um, if when the uh, Europeans started coming to this country, they, they met the Native Americans, the people that were living here um, that had never, those, Native people had never been exposed to the smallpox virus, and um, a lot of them um, have gotten, you know, entire tribes were wiped out because they were exposed to a virus that they weren't familiar with. So that's another, it's a, it's a human example, but it's very similar to what can happen to some of our native animals. Right now there's great concern uh, uh, about a virus called the Rana virus, and it's showing up. Um, and it's, it doesn't have good consequences for a lot of, of herps that are living in the wild. Uh, we have another question. If you encounter an endangered animal or an injured animal, what should you do? That's a great question. And there's actually two different, um, let's go with injured first, um, an injured animal. Um, it's always a good idea to be familiar with your options. And I'm, I'm going to assume that we're talking about wild animals or we'll, we'll, we'll because there's, there's kind of two different answers. We'll go with the wild animals first. You know, and here in our area, we have uh, several wildlife rescue groups, and they focus on injured and sick wild animals. So <clears throat> again, going to that whole concept of you know what's, what's native, knowing what lives in your area. If you find, a, <clears throat> say, a bird that's flown into a window, an animal that's been hit by a car, um, Typically, or at least in our experience, we've not been able, to, you know, the, the, the rescue groups aren't able to come out and pick up the animal, but you can sometimes work with, if it's a large or, or dangerous animal, you can work with the local police department to, to get that animal uh, control. animal control. Sometimes, although like you know, our animal control guys um, are mostly cats and dogs now, but yeah, virtually every area has a uh, wildlife rescue group. Um, some of them, uh, I know our, our most local one, Fox Valley Wildlife, is um, mostly volunteer staff. Um, their, their paid staff is, is very small and, and um, very, very busy all the time. So, uh, but we do call them on occasion, and we do help. If someone calls our nature center, even though we are not a registered uh, wildlife rehab facility, we can help get that animal to where it needs to go. Um, the um, was this last fall? I get a call 
from the fire department here in St. Charles. And kind of weird, normally, you know, we would be calling the fire department if there was an emergency, but they were calling us because there was a report of a bird that was tangled in fishing line. So um, we gathered up some equipment, we put some waders on and uh, got some towels to put over if a, if an, an, uh, bird is injured. Uh, especially a large bird like a great blue heron, you want to make sure that it's not going to hurt you, that you don't get hurt in the rescue. So we're going to put a towel over its head and then try to uh, grab it and immobilize it and then get it to the wildlife uh, rescue center so that the fishing line could be removed. Um, long story short, it turned out to not be a great blue heron and there was no fishing line. It was um, actually a, a small bird, water bird called a cormorant and they, they kind of move funny sometimes. They, they hold their wings out to dry. And I think the posture that this bird was holding to dry its wings made it look as though it was injured, and it really wasn't. That's another thing too. If you if you if you think you see something that's helpless, it it might be. If, especially if you see you know, clear signs of a broken uh, limb, a leg, or a wing, or or blood. Yes, you have an injured animal. But now we're on the verge of springtime. What happens in spring, Lisa? Well, all the babies come out. Yeah. And they're everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they are. And so often um, our local wildlife rescue people get babies brought in that don't really need to be there. Um, baby bunnies are a big one. Uh, we were talking earlier about you know, pet rabbits being let loose. The, the uh, native rabbit in our area, the little cottontail, um, the mama will lay uh, she'll have her babies in a little depression in the ground and unlike a bird who has to sit on eggs to keep them warm and sit on nestlings to keep them warm, a mama bunny doesn't really spend that much time at all at, at the nest where her young are. Um, she'll cover them, she'll pull fur from her body to cover the babies up with and then she's gone because she, uh, cottontail rabbits are, are actually prey animals themselves so if she's sitting on her babies, there's a good chance that a, uh, a hawk or an owl or a coyote, that, that she could become prey and then her, her babies wouldn't have a mom. So anyway, she leaves her babies alone for hours and hours and hours at a time. And so often people will see these bunnies in a, the small depression in their yard and they'll get worried that the mom has abandoned them. A lot of times your pet dog will be out finding because they're under bushes or under piles of leaves or something where they're protected. And the dog's just out, you know, doing its thing, and they come across you like, oh, baby bunnies have been abandoned. And so, again, you kind of have to know what's, you know, the ecology of the animal that you're looking at and what you're working with and see, okay, is that normal that the mm -hmm. mother rabbit would leave? Or is it like a bird that should be sitting on its nest or feeding or nearby? A lot of times these animals might be nearby, and if you would just walk away, they, you know, you can kind of keep an eye on it just to see if the mother rabbit or mother bird or something comes back. Because if they don't, then that's a different yeah, yeah. If, if it's 24 hours without a visit from a mom, uh, a parent, then um, then you can be pretty sure that maybe something did happen to to the mama. Um, I've talked with a, a couple of people now who have tried this and it's worked well. Um, you mentioned you know having a pet dog, and if you have a nest of bunnies in your yard and your dog discovers it, they're going to think that's the best thing in the world. They're either going to want to play with them or chew on them. Uh, most dogs love bunnies. Um, <clears throat> All right, I want them. Uh, most dogs love bunnies. Um, <clears throat> All right, I've uh, heard that people, had, you can take and make a little fence. Um, uh, the woman I talked to uh, most recently used the grate from her outdoor fire pit, and she just put it over um, the bunny's nest during the daytime when the mom is not likely to be visiting them anyway. When she let her dog out, the dog couldn't get to the bunnies because they were protected, but then she would just roll the grate out of the way then after her dog was back inside, so that way then the mom could come. So you can, if you're if you're, you're dedicated and you have that, that sort of time, you, there, there are ways that you can work around having these animals show up in your yard. I do want to address the, the second part of that question is what do you do when you encounter an, an endangered animal? Um, when, the time when I found that uh, Blanding's turtle uh, out in my yard and out on the bike trail, uh, because I knew about the Blanding's turtle and then knew about the, the program that was available, I took a picture and uh, wrote down where exactly I found it. And that way I could report that sighting to the agency that was working with the Blanding's turtles. And that way they knew another pinpoint of where these animals were found in the wild. So that helps them keep track of where these animals are and if there's viable populations out there. 
had it been injured, um, I don't know if I would have picked it up. I really don't like to handle wild animals, animals that I don't know, because you don't know if, if they are sick, they're going to bite you, claw you, whatever. And so, you know, if it's if it's fine, I would just leave it and, mm -hmm. and let it go about its business. Mm -hmm. um, we do have another question. What's the rarest animal that you have studied or seen? I would probably go back to Blandings once again. They are so very unusual <clears throat> in our area. Um, a Blandings turtle can live 80 years or more, uh, which is pretty remarkable. And to uh, find occasionally, and Lisa, you found how many now? Three? Three. Two? Um, you know, to to uh, be able to come on these uh, animals existing in the wild um, is very, very exciting. Um, the other thing, too, I want to say, um, it used to be uh, in the springtime here, like April, May, we actually heard them a couple days ago, uh, the sandhill cranes, they, because they mm. were so rare, when you heard them, you're like, oh, the sandhills are singing their back because they're migratory. And nowadays, their populations are getting, um, they're getting more populous. So we hear and see them more, but back just a handful of years, maybe five years ago, they were a little bit rarer. So that was kind of interesting to see their populations continue to grow because our habitats are getting more mm -hmm. and more well, and just one more quick story. Um, the uh, uh, you can tell we're, we're kind of into snakes. I think Lisa mentioned <laughs> she's kind of had to learn about learn to, learn to, to like snakes, snakes. Uh, because we we do have so many here. Um, all of the animals that we have here at Hickory Knolls uh, came to us out of some sort of predicament. We didn't go out into the wild and capture anything, even though a lot of our displays look, you know, like they're natural. Um, all the animals that we have have either uh, come to us because they were in need of rescue or um, they were bred specifically for use as an education uh, animal. Um, <clears throat> we did have an incident uh, and during one of our summer camps where uh, some of the kids were out. We were in a creek. And one of them said, Miss Pam, look, there's a snake on a rock. And um, our most popular species in this area is a uh, garter snake. And so I sort of figured that that's probably what it was. And then I looked again, and I realized it was actually quite different from a garter snake. It was uh, greenish in color. It did have uh, a stripe on either side of its body, but usually a garter snake will have a stripe down its back, too, and this one didn't. Well, it turns out that this snake was called a queen snake. Um, queen snakes, the last, before we found that snake, the last time a queen snake was seen in our area was in the 1980s. So it had been not visible for a very long time. Um, the creek that we found it in actually has a very uh, large population of uh, crayfish. Um, and the queen snake specializes in eating crayfish that have just molted or shed their skin. So uh, we think that's why that uh, queen snake was found there. And then we, we actually found another one after that. So queen snakes, which were once rare in our area, seem to be making Got another question, Lisa. What's your favorite animal? Oh, favorite animal. Interesting. Yeah. I'd have to say the snow leopard. I know it's not a native, but I just I go to Brookfield Zoo and I can just stand there. And oh, stand my yeah, tail, you so. love your cats. I, I do love my cats. So. <laughs> well, and, and yeah, um, you're kind of getting to love snakes. No. No. Like, you tolerate snakes. I like them. Snakes, snakes um, I, I appreciate them. I tolerate them. But if I'm outside, I like to look at them, but I don't want them going across my feet, even though they like me. And yeah, see, I'm kind of the opposite in that I have my earliest memories. I was three years old. I remember trying to find snakes, and I, I don't know why I like them so much because there are there's, actually there's some people who won't even come into our building because of the snakes. But that's um, <clears throat> my one favorite. Um, my other favorite is um, uh, actually laying down here by our feet. His name's Joey. He's a dog. He was going to make an appearance. Maybe he will at the end. He was a uh, uh, found his mom actually was found. Uh, my husband and I were on vacation in Montana, and found uh, his mom Gracie. Um, we had her checked by a vet in Montana to make sure she wasn't sick. She wasn't going to bring any germs back home that would make our other dogs sick. Uh, it turns out she wasn't sick. She was just um, going to have babies. So we she was pregnant, and a month after we found her, we we uh, got all these puppies. One of which is laying down here. We may, he may make an appearance here at the end, but he's another example of an animal that probably would not have been able to survive. He was, we were in western Montana, we were by Glacier National Park. There's wolves there, there's bears there, there's black bears, and there's grizzly bears, there's coyotes, there's a number, any number of things that probably would have eaten an entire uh, litter of puppies. 
Um, okay, we, we've got two questions. Have you noticed any other animals that are common in Southern Illinois in this area? Mm. Now, I would love to see a bobcat. Uh -huh. And we have had rumors that there have been footprints and um, never a sighting, but there are things that are coming up, especially with the climate change. We're seeing things. Um, there was rumor of a massasaga, mm -hmm. uh, our native rattlesnake uh, in the area. There's been rumors of um, uh, armadillos. Yes, the armadillos have been advancing northward, and even though they aren't uh, really considered native, I think even to the United States, they are. You know, um, naturalized in, in Texas, and they are advancing northward very rapidly. There are records, uh, at least one record of finding an armadillo in Cook County. Um, I don't know that we have a record yet in Kane County, but um, this winter, uh, at least in our area, has been very mild, and <clears throat> we've noticed changes in uh, patterns in the way uh, animals are migrating in the winter. Um, we're actually uh, working with a woman who's studying Canada geese, and she said that she's seen wood ducks that would normally migrate to uh, the southern part of the state and, and farther south in the United States. And they're staying, they were staying here here uh, throughout the winter. So uh, and that's another example of, of something. It, it's um, probably going to take a few more winters to see if that's a trend or not, but uh, we uh, this winter especially we've noticed differences in uh, migration patterns. Um, and at the moment that we have this other question, have you noticed more bald eagles in northern Illinois? Um, in the last well, probably at least 10, if not five years, uh, we have noticed them along the Fox River, which again, Pam mentioned, that's the river that runs through our town. And um, we've had people call in this year that have said they've seen what, 30. Fifth, one woman counted eagles. 50 bald eagles. Now, <clears throat> just north of us is the state of Wisconsin. And last year, when Wisconsin surveyed, uh, they did a breeding bird survey of bald eagles. And they counted more bald eagles than they'd ever recorded since they began surveying them. So some of the eagles we're seeing this winter are probably visiting from uh, Wisconsin, but uh, I know of... We of, have had breeding pairs, though, that yeah. have been in the area for several years. And I'm just old enough to remember back when the, the thought of a yeah, bald eagle breeding in this area was, was just... It, it couldn't happen. You know, we, we, they were that rare um, you know, throughout the country that... The, the, thought of a bald eagle in this area was just you know, uh, impossible. Mm -hmm. um, another question, what's your favorite amphibian? There's so many. Um, I would have to say the gray tree frog. Um, we, that's a, a, a species we have uh, here in this area. They're, uh, I, I wish I had a picture to show you. They're, they're a chunky little frog. They're a little bit bigger than a, a quarter. Maybe they're, say, silver dollar, half dollar, silver dollar size in circumference, um, chubby, sticky toe pads, um, wonderful insect eaters. They, um, uh, we will see them at our building. Even though we've tried to be sensitive, we, we do work here in a green building. It's a LEED certified building, and we've tried to not add to the light pollution in our area. We do have outside lighting for security purposes. Um, it all faces downward, but that still draws insects. And so uh, we see a lot of uh, gray tree frogs. We also see a lot of toads, which are probably one of my favorites too, the American toad. I love all the frogs, but I think that one of the cooler ones are the, uh, the tiger salamanders. Oh, because, yeah. You know, they're, they're kind of elusive sometimes, but they're really, really yeah. interesting animals. We should have brought flower to the webinar. We have a salamander that lives on our front desk uh, in, a, in, a, in a tank, um, but flower was a pet for, gosh, we think several to possibly many years. A, a, a healthy tiger salamander, you know, they can live, if they're not exposed to any weird uh, germs or diseases, they can live for 20 years or more. Um, and Flower was a, a family's pet for many years. They realized they couldn't keep it anymore, but they also realized that releasing Flower into the wild might make other salamanders sick. So, um, yeah, we have, uh, we have that tiger salamander. We actually we have a few more that have come to us by many uh, different means, too, but that's a good one. Okay, we're almost out of time. Does anyone have any other questions for us? Oh my gosh, yeah, we are. Um, if not, I want to say thank you, um, everybody tuning in. Yeah, thank you for joining us today. If you're ever in the St. Charles area, please feel free to stop by at Hickory North Discovery Center. We'd love to see you in person. Thanks again thank for you. your time. TGIF. Bye. Bye-bye.